I'm delighted to introduce our closing speaker and uh, the, the moderator for the session, uh, the president-elect of AAAS, Dr. Willie E. May, is, uh, will be moderating this session and introducing our uh, closing speaker, Marvin Anderson. Dr. May serves as the Vice President of Research and Economic Development and Professor of Chemistry at Morgan State University, Maryland's largest historically black university. He's currently a member, um, a member of the AAAS Council for the Section on Industrial Science and Technology, and uh, previously served under the served as the U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology and Director of NIST. So we are um, delighted to have you with us today to um, help us close out this session. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be with you. Uh, and I guess I'll add a little bit to the introductory to give some context to why I'm here. I guess in my role as NIST director, uh, where some of the fire research that you heard about was conducted, um, and the Undersecretary of Commerce, I, along with Sally Yates, the former Attorney General, co-chaired the uh, National Commission on Forensic Sciences. And a part of that commission, we had Peter Neufeld, you heard his name, and I'm sure our speaker will mention Peter's name uh, again, and Barry Sheck, well, they were all a part of this commission. Uh, and I'll tell you now a few minutes when I'm telling you this. Uh, a closing speaker this afternoon is Mr. Marvin Anderson, who is a retired chief of the Hanover, Virginia Fire Department and a member of the Board of Directors for the Innocence Project. He is also an Innocence Project, uh, as one of our previous speakers, exoneree, who was falsely accused and wrongfully convicted in 1982. He served over 15 years in prison and four years on parole before DNA testing helped to prove his innocence. In 2002, then Virginia Governor Mark Warner granted Mr. Anderson a full pardon. I met Mr. Anderson four years ago, today I think, actually, when I hosted him uh, and Peter Neufeld at Morgan State University. His explanation of how he overcame that ordeal uh, would have certainly broken a lesser man um, uh, to be politically correct, a lesser person. I don't know how he did it. Attorney Neufeld pointed out the mistakes made in his defense, along with the lack of jurisprudence that, uh, and due process that were part of the prosecution and convictions and some of the reforms that had been put in place to keep things like this from happening in the future. For the rest of this session, Mr. Anderson will share his experience uh, with us and will shine some light on what is possible when the law and science work hand in hand. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Dr. May, and thank you all for inviting me. Willie is fine. <laughs> In 1982, I was an um, 18-year-old high school student. I mean, at that time, I'm looking towards my future. What is it that I want to be when I grow up? Um, part of that has already started its process. At the age of 10, I started hanging around the fire department, um, cleaning trucks, rolling holes, 
cleaning the equipment, getting everything straight. I finally was able to join the fire service at the age of 13. I became a junior fireman. And from that time until I was 18, most of my life was at the fire department. Of course, I went to school, played sports, but in the afternoon, I went to the fire department. In 1982, July 17th, there was a crime that took place over the weekend in my community. Um, that evening when that crime happened, I was at a church softball event. Well, stand out of trouble. So I knew I was at. I heard most of the guys that played on the team talk about, you know, what had happened that day, you know. And I didn't pay much attention to what was going on, but I overheard most of the conversation. Well, three days later, I'm at my job and I'm working and I get called to the administrative office. I walk down to the office and there are two officers standing there waiting for me. Now, one of the officers I knew, I knew him so well that I've actually eaten dinner at his dinner table with his family. So there's that trust factor, you know, I trust him. He started questioning me, asking me about my whereabouts on that Saturday. I gave him an honest answer. I could have been anywhere. Then the next officer asked me, did I know anything about a rape that has taken place over the weekend? And I said, yes. I heard some of the guys on my team mention about a rape. He asked me once again, where were you? I said, well, that day I could have been anywhere. But I heard my teammates talking about this. So the, the officer that I knew, you know, he asked me a question. He said, Marvin, um, would you take a polygraph test? Now, 18 years old, and the only thing I knew about polygraph tests is what I've seen on television. And the only thing I knew then was that if you tell the truth, you're set free. I agreed to do so. I agreed to go down to the county lockup to have a polygraph test taken. Now, from my job site, to the county locker was no more than a 20 minute ride. When we left my job site, they stopped in between at the victim's apartment. Now, before I left out of the room for my job, I had noticed some pictures laying on the desk. It was my job ID. When we left there, they took my job ID with them. When they stopped by the victim's apartment, they went in with that same folder. They showed the victim six different sets of photos, and in each set, my job ID was in that photo array. We left the victim's apartment, proceeded to my apartment, which was on the other side of the apartment complex. They asked me, would I have a problem of them searching my house? No, I didn't. I didn't do anything. I have nothing to hide. They went into the room, went into my fiance at the time bedroom, gathered a pair of sweatpants, a brown pullover V-neck shirt, and that was it. And we proceeded down to county lockup. When we arrived to the county lockup, now I'm thinking the whole time that I'm going to have a polygraph test done on me, I tell the truth, I'm going home. Once we got there, the other officer came back into the room, but they had me and said, hey, it'll take too long to have a polygraph test set up. Would you stand in the lineup? Once again, I have nothing to hide. I agree to do so. 
Within five minutes after me arriving at county lockup, the victim showed up at county lockup. They had me change from my street clothes into a county jail uniform and brought in six other inmates at that time. We all stood in a line. Victim walked into the room. She looked at all of us. She walked out. She came back into the room, looked at all of us again, and walked out. The officer came back into the room, and he had everyone else leave the room. And I'm standing there by myself. I looked him dead in the eyes and told him that she picked me. He just looked at me. Then he says, why you say that? I said, because I know she picked me. And he said, yes, she identified you. I was later booked that evening for rape, abduction, sodomy, and robbery. Later on that night, my family posted bond. I went home. But before I left the county jail, my brother was telling my, my, my family about what the words were on the street being said about this crime. And one of the bailiffs overheard that conversation. My brother said, said Mom, you know, they're saying that, that Pop Lincoln did this crime. And the bailiff said, Pop Lincoln, I know this guy. So my mom looked at him and said, how do you know him? He said, because he had just got out on a rape charge. The next day, we go lawyer shopping. And we found a lawyer, went to him with all the information that we had gathered from the neighborhood and, and what I knew, what my brother knew, and gave it to him. My lawyer tells me that he knows Pop Lincoln as well. Now I'm saying, I'm sitting there thinking, I said, okay, all this, everybody's saying they know I didn't do this. And I'm telling my lawyer, this is open shut case. I'm not going anywhere. There's no way I can go to jail. The first preliminary hearing happened and the victim came in and she was questioned. The Commonwealth attorney asked her, said, ma'am, can you describe the person that attacked you? She said, yes. Very light skin complexion, short kinky hair, straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face. Is that person in this courtroom today? She said, yes. Will you stand up and point him out? She stood up and she pointed at me. Now this is the first preliminary hearing. On the second preliminary hearing, the same question was addressed to her again. Describe your attacker. Very light skinned complexion, short kinky hair, straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face. That's not me. On December the 14th, I went to trial. Now, I have my mother, her two neighbors, my fiance, half the community that was willing to testify where I was at at that time and what I was doing. My mother testified that he was at my house washing his car, talking to my neighbors. Her two neighbors testified that yes, he was at her house washing the car talking to us. But when it came to the time, 
the time that this crime took place. There was question about it. The crime took place between 7 and 7.30 that evening in the summertime. It's light. They wanted to know how I know where I was at at that particular time. Because for me, the day that the crime happened, I arrived to my fiance's job to pick her up from work on time for once. I've always been late. But that day, I arrived to pick her up from work on time. And she testified to that. My lawyer also had subpoenaed one John Otis Lincoln to testify in my trial, but he never testified. Now, the Commonwealth attorney went back and forth with the victim, and then once again, he asked her to describe your attacker. And once again, she described a very, very light skinned complexion person, straight white teeth, short kinky hair, no scars or blemishes in his face. He asked her once again, is that person sitting here in court? She said, yes. Will you point him out? She pointed at me. Now, according to our laws, in this country, each person has a right to a jury of their peers. My jury consisted of eight women, four men, all white. My attorney at that time asked a question to one of the officers, why did you go and questioned Marvin about this incident. He said because the victim described her attacker. Also, the victim said that he had a white girlfriend. This wasn't his first white woman. And Marvin was the only person I knew that had a white girlfriend. That was the only reason he questioned me. At some point during the trial, the judge asked everyone to take a break. Now, I go outside of the courtroom, I'm smoking a cigarette, standing there talking to my brother, and out of the blue, the victim walks up to me and says, excuse me, sir, do you have a light? As a person that I was raised to be, I said, yes, ma'am, sure, reach in my pocket and lit a cigarette. She said, thank you, and walked back to her family. My brother go, man, do you know who that was? I said, yes, that was her. Why would she come to you and ask for a light? I said, maybe she want to get a better look at me. I don't know. We go back into the courtroom, and that's my, my attorney time to, I guess, do his job. He asked the officers about the photo spread. They told him that they showed her six different sets. They all were black and white pictures, with the exception of my picture, which was color, my job ID. He then asked the officer about the lineup, the live lineup. He showed a picture to the court of the people that was in the lineup. And here's the kicker. The real perpetrator was in that lineup. My trial lasted maybe an hour and 30 minutes. 
jury deliberation didn't last four to five minutes. And they came back with a guilty verdict of two counts of rape, sodomy, robbery, and abduction, and recommended a sentencing of 210 years in prison. I turned around to look at my family who was sitting directly behind me, and I could not see them. I could hear my mother and my grandmother saying, baby, don't worry, everything's gonna be all right, but I could not see them. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I cried the whole night in jail. When it was bring around breakfast the next morning, I was still crying. Later on that week, we hired another lawyer. The first one didn't do a good job. The lawyer came down and he questioned me about what happened, what do I know, and that he had already spoken to my family. And he was telling me about the information that he had gathered just from the community about this John Otis Lincoln. He explained the process of me having to put in an appeal to the courts to the, and, and try to get back in the courts and move forward trying to get me out. Well, we did that. Circuit Court denied my appeal. We filed to the Virginia State Supreme Court. They denied my appeal. Six years into my sentencing, Mr. John Otis Lincoln wrote a letter to the judge and said that he needed to get back in the court. He had something he had to say. I thought he was joking. We had the motion made. He came back to court. Mr. Lincoln testified word for word to what the victim described what happened to her that day. He said he approached a white woman on a, while he was on a bicycle. She was walking down a path carrying a bucket of chicken. He asked her if he could walk with her home. She said, no, I don't live too far. I'll be fine. He said he proceeded down the path and act like he had an injury to his knee and fell off the bicycle. He said when she stopped to assist him, that's when he grabbed her and he beat her and he raped her and he pulled her further into the woods and beat her and raped her again. This is what the victim testified to what happened to her that day. Not only that, Mr. Lincoln was a very, very light-skinned complexion person with short kinky hair, no scars or blemishes in his face, and he had straight white teeth. This is what the victim testified to, to who did this to her. A month later, I received a letter from the judge saying that I don't believe him. He lies. He lies all the time. Appeal not granted. I spent 15 years incarcerated for something that I did not do that our legal system knew I did not do. That the real perpetrator has came back to court, confessed to committing the crime, and our justice system still refused to believe him or believe me. 1997, after being denied for parole for nine times, all because I wouldn't admit to a crime I did not commit. That was the only reason I was being denied parole. I was finally granted parole. I came home and it was during the time that the Innocent Project was about to close my case because they couldn't find any evidence. But one first year student lawyer begged and pleaded with Barry and Peter not to close my case. She said, he's home on parole. He's still saying he's innocent. 
There has to be something. Well, Mr. Neufeld decided to call back down to Virginia and talk to Dr. Farrell, forensic scientist there at that time. He said, would you please look through your archives to see if you could find anything? And when he did, he found samples of their perk kit that was taken back in 1982. Dr. Mary Jane Burton, who was a forensic scientist at that time in 82, every case that came across her desk, she chose to take a small sample and put it in a separate file than what she had to send back to the courts. They found my sample. They ran DNA testing on it, came back, excluded me, but yet, it hit someone else. The testing that was done, and the marker, and it hit, was one John Otis Lincoln. From that moment, I didn't know what to think. And granted, I'm already free on parole. I'm not free, but I'm on parole. I'm not incarcerated, but I'm on parole, but I'm not free. What do we do next? Attorney General of the State of Virginia decided that we couldn't do any more testing because they wanted to know who had the chain of custody of the per kit. I asked Mr. Newfell, what does that mean? He said, well, they, need, they want to know whether or not, Marvin, you had possession of the per kit while you was incarcerated. And I just looked at Mr. Newfield like, for real? You know, how would I have access of a rape per kit? So we had to go back to the circuit court, file a new motion, and the judge at that time then granted testing to be proceeded forward. They did DNA testing once again. It excluded me, but you had to hit John Lewis Lincoln. In 2002, as Dr. May said, <clears throat> Governor Mark Warner granted me a full unconditional pardon. That same year, 2002, I joined the same fire department that I joined it when I was 10 years old to try to complete a dream that I had. I joined the fire academy. I went into the fire academy. 34 years old with a bunch of 18, 19, and 20 year old kids, and they was calling me Pop. <laughs> but I graduated top two in my class. Only reason I didn't graduate top one because she used to bake brownies and give it to our instructors <laughs> every day. <laughs> but it was a dream. A dream that I had before all of this changed my life. I've always wanted to become a fireman. After two years of completing the academy, I became a lieutenant. A year later, I became a captain. A year later, I became a chief. So when Christina was talking about the file scene that she had in her case, I knew exactly what she was talking about. We are trained to go into a burning building and observe a fire pattern. I knew what she was talking about. This past two years, um, I actually been able to relax a little bit because I retired from the fire service after being chief for over 12 years. Um, I have retired from my trucking company, and now I'm just trying to give this knowledge of what happened to me can happen to any one of us on any given day. Any given day. We are living in a society today that they rather believe a false lie than to believe the truth.
granted, it was science that gave me my life back, DNA. In 82, DNA wasn't known, but there were scientists that was working on it. What I don't understand today is that our court systems use scientific evidence to convict people, but that we have to fight so hard to use scientific evidence to prove someone an innocent. Why is it that? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me, for hearing my story, and for helping me with this cause, that right cause to fight for. Thank you. Well, I'll start the questioning. How did you forgive? I won't say you forgot, but I, as I said, I think a lesser human being would have been just consumed with anger, self-pity. How did you do it, man? That's a question that I, I get asked a lot. And I can go back to my upbringing. Um, I grew up in a community that when you said you have mothers in the community that raise kids, well, my mother consisted of my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, my neighbor their neighbor, and so on. I stayed in church, had to go to church every Sunday. I prayed then, but I didn't know how to pray. After being denied parole nine times, um, and like I said, while I was incarcerated, I prayed every day, every night. You know, I would ask God why. You know, why me? You know, you know, I didn't do this. You know, these are the questions that I, I, I asked God. Why me? And on that last night that I prayed, after being denied for the ninth time, you know, it was different. I didn't just pray. I talked. I had a conversation with him. You know, and the conversation was, You know, I didn't commit this crime. I don't belong here. I put my trust and faith in man who has let me down. Now I'm putting my faith and trust in you. You do your will. Two months later, I was granted parole after being denied. The victim is not to blame in my case. What happened to her was real. She was re raped, she was beaten, she was dragged into the bushes and left for dead. That is real. However, I wasn't the person that did these crimes to her. However, the photo spread that was shown to her Black and white pictures with my only ID is a color picture shown to her six different times. And then within 20 minutes after showing to her this photo spread, she sees me standing in front of her, 
her mind is going to relate to the last person she's seen in person, which was me. So I cannot blame her. Our justice system has screwed up in so many ways. Not only in my case, but cases across the whole United States. So, me dealing and, and, and moving forward with my life, there's, there's no way I can be mad or hate her for what happened. If I were to do that, I wouldn't have been able to complete my education while I was incarcerated, became a certified welder, a certified carpenter, and a certified mechanic. With all that angle, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish any of that. I kept my mind focused on moving forward. How can I better myself? You know, I'm not going to be here forever. One day, just one day. I just didn't know when that day would come. When you told this story at Morgan four years ago today, there were tears in the audience, and I was one of them, man. I don't know how you did it. Hi, I'm Valerie Hans from Cornell Law School, and I, I just want to thank you. I know everybody feels this way too for sharing this uh, this story and illustrating ways in which people can, through a whole series of events and mis uh, mistakes, can be wrongfully convicted. And and I, I it really makes a difference to hear the individual stories. I you know I think. It's, it's absolutely the case before DNA, people were wrongfully convicted and would explain, explain, explain. They are wrongfully convicted, they didn't do it. And nobody could believe it. It's, it's, a, it's like a confirmation bias or something. You, you said, wait, no, the evidence was there, it was presented in court, you know, you must be guilty, you're just trying to get away with something. But, um, but uh, then DNA happened and showed us, oh yeah, there is error in our system and we have to take this seriously. And I think that then allowed us to really begin looking at some of the faults in the scientific evidence that was used and, and the kinds of uh, issues with eyewitness identification that you described happening in your case, the multiple series of photo displays that only included your photograph and uh, followed by the lineup. Um, so, so thank you for that. I, I do want to say that um, exonerations, now that we know there really can be exonerations from DNA, I think um, uh, I did uh, make a difference and I did a study with some of my colleagues at Cornell Law School where we looked at the likelihood of death sentences across the United States and the factors that contributed to death sentences in a particular state. Um, one of them, interestingly, was whether or not it was a judge death penalty state uh, as opposed to a jury death penalty state. Turns out judges were more likely to give death sentences than juries. Uh, but another factor was the number of exonerations in a state. So if people uh, recognized or learned about exonerations in a state, um, that decreased um, the likelihood of death sentences in subsequent years. So that's one illustration of how information about how justice can go wrong um, can really have a big impact on people's responses in the justice system. So thank you again. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I really appreciated the point that you made at the end saying, you know, that science, we use it and we trust it in convicting and why don't we use it and trust it in exoneration kind of over and over again and kind of the different ways that we look at science when it fits the narrative that we want versus when it doesn't, when we pretend it's this objective thing, right, but we're fitting it into these narratives. Um, I saw in your bio that you're on the board of the, the Innocence Project and you're doing this other work now and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that work that you're doing um, and also if you have any other thoughts kind of on how as scientists, as folks that are in, um, in this community, 
we can help to, I guess, share that message, you know, thinking about the, the own, our own biases in science and how the system kind of has these biases around it um, and how we can, I guess, better shape that narrative that, that, you're, that you're sharing with us today. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've been on the, the board of Innocent Project in New York for about eight years, nine years, maybe more. Um, a lot of the work that I do is educating kids. Um, every year I spend at least a month up here in Reston talking to the CSI youth program that they have here. And these are kids that are from all over the world that wants to become scientists, lawyers, prosecutors, um, investigators. And I I actually have a game that I play with them, but it's not a game. And one of the games that I, I play with them is that while I'm talking to them, I have a student walk behind me while I'm talking. And I ask him, I mean, I, I go on through my speech and, and telling them everything. And then I go, wait a minute, can anyone describe that person that walked behind me? And of course, they all got their hands up, raised, I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, I had this one young lady, and she said, I can't, and I said, okay, describe. And she described someone totally different. And I said, you're wrong. She says, oops, my bad. And I explained to her, your oops, my bag just gave him a death sentence. That's all it takes. And this was a, a young man that she had seen that whole week. They've been coming up here to D.C. to, to the, um, the Capitol and, and visiting these places the whole week. And she still could not describe it. And so you imagine that if a person who is being traumatized doing a real crime, You cannot focus on the individual in front of you as you think you can. Um, high schools have problems with the youth in high schools. I try to explain to them that, you know, it's an old saying that my grandmother told me when I was 18 years old, two months before I got arrested. I stopped by our house one day. I said, Grandma, how you doing? She said, uh, I'm doing fine. I'm still kicking, but I ain't kicking so hard, but I'm still kicking. She said, boy, what are you doing? I said, you know, Grandma, you know, my usual, having fun, you know, summertime. She said, all right. She said, I heard about your girlfriend. And I'm trying to figure out how you hear about my girlfriend. Um, she said, all right, boy, you know, let me tell you something. Trouble easy to get into, but it's hard to get out of. It went in one ear and out the other. I'm 18 years old. I'm having fun. Two months later, I was arrested. And those words, what she said to me, will always be with me. Trouble is easy to get into, but hard to get out of. Well, we have one of the celebrity in the audience, and I'll ask her to stand. Mrs. Marvin Anderson, stand. Yes, hi, I'm sorry. Um, I have a question as well, but it's not as cerebral as some of the other questions and comments. I was just curious, um, did the system ever make an effort to correct and actually hold Mr. Lincoln accountable for the fact that he had victimized that woman? Yes. Um, <clears throat> after I was granted you know, my pardon from the governor, um, Mr. Lincoln had a trial date. And the only reason he had a trial date because he was just getting ready to get released on parole again. And the county pressed charges against him. Um, he had a trial. The victim came back into town. She testified 
uh, I had to go back and testify that yes, I was found guilty of the crime, but I'm not guilty and all of that good stuff. Mr. Lincoln received two life sentences plus 41 years. So he will remain in prison. Did the state of Virginia ever do anything for you other than say, oops, how bad? <laughs> Virginia is a Commonwealth state, so basically you cannot sue the state. Yeah, but they could voluntarily. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had to get uh, one of our senators, may God rest his peace, um, Dr. Benjamin Lambert, a state senator, he presented a bill before in favor of compensation. And during that bill, <clears throat> there was another bill that was being presented before my bill. And it was a horse stable. The state awarded this horse stable, which had caught on fire, $300,000 to get rebuilt and restabled. This is what the state awarded this horse farm. When my bill came about, <clears throat> they wanted to give me two, was it, $25,000. And Dr. Lambert fought, and he fought. And they did end up giving me compensation. Um, is it enough? Taking someone's life away from society when they didn't do anything, there's no amount of money to replace that. During that time, I lost family members. I lost my brother to a, motor, a car accident. I lost aunts, uncles. You know, that's time out of a person's life that I can never get back. You know, um, but the fact that they thought a animals had more value than a human's life doesn't make sense. Well, I don't see any questions. I thank you, the audience, for your participation in these discussions. And I'll just say that this discussion, these discussions have inspired me since I have some latitude for the Boston Meetings program. I've been inspired and based on your inspiration, you too, you too. <laughs> uh, I'm going to suggest that we have a session using science to find or maybe using science to enact justice where we would have folks like the two exonerees that we had here to join us uh, and that would be part of it we would have uh, maybe some other what we would uh, look at this whole area of how science can impact uh, probable proper and responsible jurisprudence. So thank you for your participation. Thank you.